the first speaker is Manuel, um, who you probably all know. Uh, he co-founded Abbey Games. I saw that you're going to talk about it, so I'm just going to let you do that. And um, his presentation is aptly called "Proud to Play." All right, enjoy. So, um, uh, proud to play. That's my title. I'll explain why in a, a bit. Um, so, who am I? My name is Manuel Kersenmakers. Um, I'm from the Netherlands. And I'm a gamer. I've been a gamer for a long, just like probably all of you. Uh, I'm a developer as well since uh, since I was 15, probably. Uh, and I really love AI. So, um, I love to do things with artificial intelligence. Um, and I'm not so sure that's a, uh, the question of this presentation, whether I'm uh, proud of being a gamer and a developer. Actually, I am, it's a spoiler. But uh, that's uh, like the conflict that I've uh, been dealing uh, with a, a little bit. So to know what I've done for the past uh, two years, I want to talk about uh, Abbey Games. And Abbey Games is the studio I co-founded uh, about two years ago, two years and a month ago. Uh, and with Abbey Games, we basically created one game, which is Vos. Um, just to get a picture, who knows about Vos? Who knows that it exists? Okay. Cool, very cool. Um, I have to use the mic, yeah? Okay, sorry. I'm using the mic. <laughs> I'm using the mic. Okay, um, Okay. so Rose looks like this for the people who don't know it. Um, it's a game about giants, and these are, yeah, this is one of the giants, it's the forest giant, and he's over this little town. And Rose is basically a god game, so you might think of black and white. Um, you have the power to create the earth, to shape it, to place resources, and then humanity just shows up and does their thing. So I'll tell you how uh, we came there, and uh, the story in short is uh, the before and after. We started out with no game, no company, no not anything, and we ended up with all of this, um, which is uh, something I am proud about. Um, so what happened in between is um, these things, very shortly. A lot of people helped us, we got a lot of support. We, of course, worked hard and learned hard, because you should do that. Uh, but where did it all start? It started in the dungeon. And a dungeon is something um, spooky, but it's not a dark dungeon. It's a very light dungeon, very artificial light dungeon. And that's where the first inspiration struck. And this is Adrian. He's one of the uh, co-founders. And he got, well, OK, so this is um, it's awkward. <laughs> Um, so what, what was the inspiration for this? Actually, it was a movie that already really captured the theme and the visual uh, art of the uh, game pretty well. Um, it was a, a movie called Amongst Giants, which was also our project name for a long time. I'm not going to show it because there's not so much time, but I'm going to go through it uh, very quickly. It's created by Marcus Wagner, and it's, uh, actually it's a, 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 um, a clip to a soundtrack. Uh, so it's about uh, humanity using these wires, there's a wire here, to do all kinds of uh, civil civilized thing. things like uh, cutting trees, uh, creating oil wells, or uh, uh, pumping from oil wells, creating ships, uh, and pulling down giants. What? So the thing about this movie is that uh, there's a giant that is powering all these uh, humans, and they make so much use of him that they actually pull him down. And that's the tragic part about it. And we thought that would be really cool for a god game because the giant is also um, uh, able to do terrascaping. Here it creates the mountains and it has created the ocean, all kind of stuff. It's a really nice movie. And we thought this can be a really cool god game. So we set out and we thought we can create a god game because how hard can, can it be to create a god game with uh, four people? And we already had the full team. Uh, two programmers, one designer, and one artist, because that's all you need to create a nice game. Actually, it's four times as much people as you need to create a game. Um, but what we didn't realize at the time was that we actually had this team. We only had programmers. We were all from university. We started there, and we had no artists and no real designers. So we started up uh, making a concept for our game, and it would look like this. It would have a planet and it would have giants, because that was what the game was about, and also little tiny villages on the planet. 
Um, so, and we, all, uh, we already had the one truth about how to make your process. We would have the people who would do new things, and we would have the people who create beautiful things, and together we would do like cyclic development because we knew cyclic development was very important. And then our process would basically look like this. Somebody would just puke out all the features and the rest would be cleaned up by the, the polish team. Uh, that didn't really work, but we did make some progress. So the first few months of the project's first half year was like this. Uh, we created a planet, we created triangles, textures, uh, thirds, villages, eggs. There were eggs in the game, giant eggs. They're not in the game anymore. Thought bubbles. And then it was time for incubation. Uh, some people tried to tell us we weren't serious enough about it all, but we really wanted to be serious about it, so we tried for the incubator. You might know the Dutch Game Garden in the Netherlands, in Utrecht, which is a really cool place. Um, and there you can learn lots of things about creating a business, not so much about creating a game, uh, except for the people that are also in the incubator. So then we uh, scaled up the team. We had our uh, obliged uh, business person uh, who fell out later. And we had our first office. This was our first office, um, very dark, and a little bit lighter. Yeah, it's not so clear. Uh, so uh, this is actually the Vlambeer office now. Um, so the cool thing about the Dutch Game Garden was that uh, there were lots of other developers. So this, this was our floor, and uh, you, you got there the, like Control Magazine, which does a lot of journalism uh, for the game dev industry in the Netherlands. Uh, you got Abbey Games, very famous. You got Ronimo Games, uh, famous from Awesome Nuts, and uh, Vlambeer, who helped us a lot as well. Uh, so these people could tell us a lot about how to create a game, how to create a studio. And um, then the Dutch Game Garden told us that we needed a business model canvas. We still don't have a business model canvas, but we did think a lot about other things than games, which was, in the end, quite valuable. So we started with a new concept, which uh, we wanted to uh, show at Gamescom. And the new concept would look like giants and humanity fighting. Uh, apparently, there was uh, something people want in God games, like the match of power. But we uh, in the end decided that the game would be much more about striking a balance, a balance in the growth of civilization. You would start out with small villages and you would nurture them to create uh, big civilizations. So that was the theme of the game. We thought a game, a god game should be about balance because if you're all powerful, there's no challenge in being the most powerful. The challenge should be in the balance. So then was dev time. Uh, we scaled up again. We uh, finally realized that we didn't have any artists in the team. And we got artists, and we even got, uh, so we called our previous artist a graphics programmer, because that was what it really was. We got audio people in, and we worked a lot with uh, a more normal method, which worked quite well for us, a lot of post-its. Um, and we even worked at nights. So what you see here in all the pixels is the Harlem Shake being recorded in Utrecht. And it was a very uh, important cultural moment in Utrecht, but we decided just to work on, uh, on the game rather than joining in. So, um, yeah, things started to happen. People uh, broke the build. We tested, we programmed. Uh, there was a rave party at some point. There were bugs, AI bugs. Who was responsible for the AI? I don't know. Um, this is sort of a bug, but actually it's more like a gender feature. It's a, a man in a pink robe. Um, and then the game started to look more like the left one, which still isn't finished, um, but a lot happened in between. So, uh, we also did some jams in between because sometimes it might be very nice to just stop uh, developing and do other development on uh, more tiny games. Um, so this was more, more or less the final look. The Swamp Giant looks a little bit different, but there were four characters that, uh, that nurtured the world and you could control all of them. And uh, so there was a lot of progress with these real artists. And also the gameplay changed a lot over the course. When, while we started out with doing a full uh, nature simulation, we realized that we would actually need a lot, uh, a lot more gameplay rules to create a fun game uh, out of this. You can't just simulate nature and hope it's fun for people. Um, apparently, it's really annoying when you change one tiny feature in the landscape and entire civilizations uh, get destructed because of that. Um, and then onwards to release, when we uh, uh, came towards release, an important thing was, of course, um, oh, to scale up again. Yeah, this was a team that we finished the game with. Um, most people worked three-fifths of the, the week, so there were a lot of communication problems, as you might 
uh, suspect, but it was a lot of fun and people worked really hard even though they didn't really get uh, any salary. They only knew that just like us, they would benefit from the release of the game. And it was a really nice model to work with. Uh, we got our website, we did all these PR things which you apparently need to do when you launch a game. Um, and then our game was on Steam and it did really well and it was fun and this was exactly a year and a day uh, ago. Um, so that's Reus. Um, I'm quite proud of Reus, it's something we pulled off out of, out of nothing. Uh, but what I'm most proud of here is that we created an, an entertainment game that at least uh, niche gamers like, but also uh, kind of a lot of mainstream gamers. And we created a game that wasn't necessarily about uh, violence or uh, it wasn't necessarily a shooter that had the same mechanics as always. It was a game that was uh, with new mechanics about a valuable theme. And even though we focused on the, uh, the entertainment part of the game, we did get some reactions, like um, a person telling us he uh, understood the relation with his parents better because of our game. Rose is very much about uh, the greed that people show when they get too much. So that's probably kind of um, isomorphic with your relation uh, with your parents. That was really nice to hear. Um, and I think we created a game that was, that was valuable more than just because of uh, the fun. And it was actually not our first game, Rose. It was our fourth game. There were some collaborations beforehand to, uh, on which we decided to actually start a game studio. And these are the games we're less proud of that we don't really uh, acknowledge, but I'm here to reveal them to you. Please don't tell the media. Um, so they were Tiny Tannic, Damschewer and Lama Palooza. And at that time we thought we were just going to make something fun and ridiculous. And um, these were the games. So the first game was Tiny Tannic. And Tiny Tannic is basically a game about uh, ridiculing the disaster that happened on a Tiny Tannic. It still was a lot of fun, but it, we didn't really think it through. The another game was about a uh, Damschewer. The Damschewer is a, a guy that during the um, uh, during an important event in the Netherlands, remembering the death of the wars, uh, just shouted very hard, a lot, and it uh, panicked people and it even traumatized some people and we thought it would be fun to make a fun game about. So what you basically do here is shout really hard and chase people away. It was a school project. Um, again, we didn't really think it through, but it was fun. And we created Lama Palooza, which was, uh, again, ridiculing um, things like animal cruelty and national stereotypes. Okay, of course I'm exaggerating a little bit, but what, um, what I want to say here is we only thought about uh, the game should be fun to play. And um, what, um, what I actually uh, caught, um, what I actually saw in academic research at the time was the research by, um, I think, Robin Hunicke and Mark LeBlanc and uh, Robert Zubek uh, about uh, model uh, mechanics, dynamics, and aesthetics. So who of you knows that? Yeah, so uh, I'll just go through them. The idea is that uh, a game has mechanics which are really tiny things like uh, you can jump by pressing space or you can, um, uh, you can click on things and that will give a pop-up menu. There are dynamics that are more or less experiences that you can have like a, um, like a player, like uh, having the vibe of running and shooting or having the feel of creating an ocean in the game. Um, and then there's aesthetics. And aesthetics are the, like, the important part. Why do we enjoy uh, games? Why do we feel that games are appealing to us or enjoyable? So the um, very, common, uh, very common aesthetic is challenge. Um, this is not the truth, of course, but this is just some research that shows that there's a lot of uh, ways to enjoy games. And challenge is um, um, yeah, just the, f the feeling that a game is difficult and that you want to play it again just to fix, uh, just to get through the challenge. Then there's uh, also other things like um, fantasy. Lots of, lots of us play games to have a certain fantasy and not necessarily like a medieval fantasy, I want to be the champion, but also the fantasy of um, a truck simulator, a truck driver. So that can also be an important uh, fantasy for people. They play games because they want to try being someone else. Discovery, a really important thing which is present in almost any game. You just want to discover what uh, levels are there, what is this world shape like, what is, are the characters' feelings in these games. Um, very big motivator. Uh, narrative, some, some games are about the development of narrative and you're basically exploring narrative, the same reason why you would uh, read a book rather than just put it away and never look at it again. 
uh, expression. Uh, of course, games allow for agency, for interactivity. This is why games can do this really well. They offer the player tools to do their own expression with. And even if your tools are just walking, you can actually uh, express yourself already by your behavior. Um, and some games have this a lot, and some games have this less, of course. Uh, fellowship, most multiplayer games you enjoy because you play them with friends, not necessarily with each other, but also against each other. And then uh, the fellowship aesthetic uh, comes in play. Sensation is to just, you just play a game because you really, really like to, to hear it, to feel it, to, um, to, to play it, to listen to it. And then there's the reason that we all play uh, at some time Candy Crush, Bejeweled, or, or Pachance, or Minesweeper. It's just a mission. You just want to zone out. You want to like, be somewhere else with your mind. Not necessarily in the real world. You want to submit to the game. And those are eight aesthetics. Um, and it's really interesting to think about which aesthetics are important in your own game if you're creating your own game, of, uh, or uh, what you're enjoying about games. It might actually help you find the games uh, you enjoy more. Um, so what I want to do is uh, play a game with you guys. Um, let's play a game. And this game is basically to uh, take us through a whole lot of games, but rather than me picking the games, you guys get to pick the games. And uh, what we're going to do is uh, I'll talk about the games you pick, and um, we can think about which aesthetics are in that game for yourself. So the rules are uh, whenever uh, there are, um, there's a new slide, there are two titles on the screen. And the first person to shout out one of those titles decides which game we're going to talk about. Uh, then everyone puts up their hand to show interest in the game. And as soon as you lose interest, or as soon as you figured out what the aesthetics in this game are, because that's really the challenge for you, like which one, two, or three aesthetics are in this game, put down your hand. And as soon as like 50% uh, of you puts down their hand, I'll go on to the next game. Um, thing is, um, we're only going to do this for two minutes, and we're going to see which level we're going to reach. And non-gamers reach level four, so that's like the score to beat. Um, okay, so we'll start in five, four, three, two, one. The timer started. Kerbal Space Program. Okay, so uh, put up your hands. I'm going to talk about Kerbal Space Program. Kerbal Space Program is a game that I really, um, really admire because it simulates a lot of uh, actual physics in the world. Uh, people enjoy it because they want to send things into space. They want to discover what space is and whether their rockets work. Um, but uh, what the thing is, if you really play this game well, you actually get well in rocket physics. How? Oh, okay, so, sorry. Okay, level two. Okay. Journey. Journey. Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, so Journey from the character over there. Journey is a game about, uh, f yeah, I'll put up your hand. Um, which aesthetics play in Journey? I think uh, there's a lot of, I'm not going to spoil that, of course. You play this game in a desert, a beautiful desert. You enjoy feeling, um, uh, feeling the sand, hearing the soundtrack, and you enjoy meeting other people. This is... Uh, okay. Level three. Okay, you're almost at level three. You still got one. Okay, papers, papers please. Okay, so papers please, um, very interesting. You get to, to do something uh, quite boring actually, but still it's very challenging, and you get to make money for your family, you get to find me medicines, and there's really a lot of interesting stuff. <laughs> okay, level four. Evil line. Evil line, yeah, definitely best choice. Put up your hands. Uh, so Evil Line is the, like the best, it's like a whole different universe and we all get to see stories from the universe without actually uh, losing the casualties in this real space battle. We get to experience a real space battle. And so, oh, okay. Um, then you're already in level five. The Sims. The Sims. <laughs> yeah, we enjoy The Sims. Like, both of these games are about freedom, but uh, what The Sims is really about is about uh, living any life, about fantasizing what it would be like to have a relationship with your neighbor. So. And then there's the bonus level. We still have 10 seconds left. Puzzle Pirates it is. So these games aren't alike at all, but Puzzle Pirates is playing puzzles and going online and playing uh, these puzzles together with friends and your crew, and uh, that was it. Okay, so... Apparently, you, okay, you took two seconds too much, but then also you reached the last level. So apparently you're better at um, diagnosing games than the non-gamer. Okay, so uh, thanks for playing this game with me. It was just like to 
uh, show a whole lot of games in a short time span. Uh, of course, uh, many of you know these games better than I do. Uh, um, yeah, so uh, there are a lot of things to enjoy about games, and that's one reason to be really proud on games. Um, I think uh, th by exploring more than just a challenging mechanic, more than just having uh, the uh, simple fun or s sensation or submission, or sensation can actually be really artful, really meaningful, um, I think it's uh, important that we explore all these mechanics together and that we uh, show more people that there's not only the challenge mechanic in games and that we can actually uh, enjoy games in different ways. Um, so there was a, like a moment when I was way younger that I wasn't really proud on um, being a gamer. And I think, I started thinking about this, and I think that um, it illustrates quite well the social stigma that there is on gaming for a lot of people. I don't know if people in this room experience that, but I experienced it definitely. So this is the story about uh, the RuneScape date. Um, how many of you know RuneScape? Okay, so RuneScape is, uh, of course, this amazing online world in which you live your medieval fantasy. And um, there are lots of other players in there. Uh, I was in there probably when, when I was 12, 13, I don't know my youth that well, but I was in there, and there were lots of other people in there, and some of those people were, were girls, and I think that they were girls, at least they were female characters. And I, um, um, to some of them, I felt really attracted. And there was this one girl that I re really would like to take on an online date. Um, of course, I haven't told people about that uh, yet, except for one, one, one time earlier. Um, but I was fantasizing about what she uh, would like. Um, would she like me to cut down the whole forest, creating campfires all over her favorite spot? And then <laughs> could I maybe bake that beautiful in-game in, in pie or, or cake? And um, maybe recite a, like a poem in the in-game chat about how beautiful this online world was. Um, but the, the anticlimactic part about the story is that I actually never took her on that date. I, um, I just didn't do it, and she stopped coming online. And then, yeah, it was like a really sad ending of the love story. Um, so what does this have to do with pride? Of course, I, I'm not proud that I didn't do it. I wanted to have done it. I would think of myself as a cooler person if I had done it. But what I don't know, if I tell a story to people, um, do they think, um, is, it, is it more shameful for me to tell that I didn't do it, or is it more shameful for me to tell people that I did do this, that I did take her on a date? It really depends on the people, and I want everyone to, all the non-gamers to think, it's cool if you had taken her on a date, because it's a valuable life experience to take people on a date, even if it's online. So that's the story of the anticlimactic RuneScape date. I wasn't uh, proud on uh, me as a gamer at that time, but what really helped me in becoming proud as a gamer was uh, Day9. Day9 is this super cool person. Who knows Day9? I think he's a super cool person. What he, uh, he's a StarCraft, two pro game, or StarCraft 1 pro gamer. He won the World Cyber Games at a time, and then he does a lot of shoutcasting, and he is a show that's uh, focused on creating um, or being a better gamer. He wants you to be a better gamer, play better, think better, uh, enjoy it better, and be proud of it. And uh, he has this episode, the 100th episode, in which he talks about his life. And um, actually, if you watch it, it's like more than an hour, and it brings you to, even to tears, because he tells how uh, his mother supported him through his life as a pro gamer, how his relationship with his brother developed through uh, gaming. And it was really a moment for me to realize, OK, so apparently, gaming is a really cool thing to do. Um, you can really develop yourself and your relationships with gaming, even if it's something as competitive or um, competitive and violent as StarCraft 2, a real-time strategy game about killing aliens and stuff. So, um, yeah, I have one, like, ruthless, oversimplifying slide left that I want to show you. Um, so, I think gaming is the future of our culture. Um, of course, everyone here uh, knows that games are very powerful. And what we have right now is, this is ruthless oversimplification, is media that have, are very strong in uh, creating an image, imagination that, uh, like books, they really trigger your imagination. You think about worlds, uh, and, and especially movies and series are really uh, strong in world building and creating a story for you to follow. And uh, 
they are very strong in that, and that's what we really value. I think that's what I really value about those media. But what they, of course, lack is agency. So that, that interactivity, I think that's an axis that you can put on the space that we already have of media. And of course, it's hard to, to um, have, as good a, uh, have as much imagination in a game as you could have in a good book when you really have a rich fantasy. But uh, I think that we can definitely create way better quality um, uh, inter or, um, media experiences if we look at all these things. And of course, there are way more dimensions that all of you are exploring, and I would love to like, talk, talk to you about that. So, um, yeah, I'm really proud of being a gamer to create games, and I want all of you to be proud, and I want other people to like, respect us and say, oh, that guy, that girl plays a lot of games, and we should, we should call him sophisticated for that. He's a sophisticated gamer. That's what I want. And there's no time left, too. Uh, this is our new game. Oh, we're trying to do all that in this game, but ask me about it later. Um, so that was it. Are there any questions? Thank you. Oh, there's no real time for questions, right? There is real time for questions. Um, yeah, so ask me about Rose development if you want. Ask me about, um, not about the date. Ask me. Yeah, so basically most of those things that were on there. It's actually a list compiled by uh, Joost van Dongen, who is um, founder at Ronimo Games, which created Awesome Nuts. And he thought, let's put down what you all have to do. <laughs> yeah, so, oh, okay, so, sorry. Um, yeah. The most important one, is, of course, is uh, make a game that stands out, make a game that has unique selling points. Um, what, so a few things that we did, uh, create trailers. We created a really bad trailer in the start, but then we created better trailers as we were going on. Uh, find your own voice, a really important one. Like, know how you want to talk. Are you, are you that really uh, macho guy talking about your game, or are you, uh, so do you want to go for pride, or do you want to go for honesty or intelligence, or how do you want your voice to sound? Don't show crap. I think you can show crap. I think Bastion got away with showing their like really early prototype. Spend a lot of time on marketing. Good advice. Just look up the list. And um, so, oh yeah, one important thing I should tell is that Rose was a God game, and that was a conscious choice because God games are super cool. Everyone wants to play a God game, but the last God game, last real God game, only came out like 12 years ago. I think it was black and white. And of course, there was From Dust, which it's sort of a god game, but it's more of a like a landscape puzzle. Um, so yeah, people were waiting for our game, and it was really vibrant, colored in comparison to like Metro 2033 that came out at the time. 2033? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. So it. Took, yeah, it took very long before we came past that first circle. It was um, there were like 200 people that knew about the game, and that didn't really change until the first gameplay trailer. Like without gameplay trailer, you can really do little, I think, or we can do little, or you have to be creative about creating your own news. Um, yeah, so from the gameplay trailer, we got people interested in what the game was, how it played, and then we did some uh, development diaries. So Adrian would just talk with his uh, like bad English accent about the game, and people would really enjoy that because they just would learn more about the game. So it's, it's basically about realizing what is interesting information for your audience, and then um, uh, putting that into smaller bundles. Okay, so let's get on to the next talker. I think I'll give the mic back to you. <laughs>